and then take a final um, a final decision. And uh, just a quick intro, uh, Jung Hyuk, um, I believe you started in 2017 or 2016? 2016, um, fall semester. Fall semester 2016, okay. And he joined one of the, uh, uh, my, my humanoid uh, robotic project, uh, which we call it Draco. And he initially worked uh, um, uh, quite a bit on, on the mechatronics. Uh, and these are very complex humanoids uh, are, are very complex systems as, as, as we all know. So he spent um, incredible amount of time on, on, um, on, on the mechanical and, and embedded system, um, low level control, uh, filters, um, feedback control and, and so on level. And he published this work in the IEEE International Conference in Humanoid Robotics in 2019. Uh, but actually, prior to that, the year before, he had uh, led um, uh, another publication, uh, which was focused on, on theory uh, and algorithms, I would say more algorithms, uh, for IROS, uh, addressing the topic of kinodynamic planning for humanoid robots that is um, um, as you can imagine, is the state of space is very, very large. So it's a, an important problem. And as the next uh, part of his work, he, uh, John Kyok, uh, work on a, on a RAL, IEEE uh, Robotics and Automation Letters uh, publication, focusing on, um, on combining data-driven and, um, and model-driven approaches uh, for data efficiency, in particular for robustifying uh, locomotion for, uh, for robotics. And um, and then this motivated. Um, so this was more of an application paper, the RAL paper. But then at the theory level, that motivated another paper for um, a new conference called Learning for Dynamics and Controls that you might be aware of, um, which is more theory oriented. And in there, he published sort of a, a general method uh, for using something called a nested mixture of experts. Which means basically is he's combining model-based and model-free um, 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 sort of uh, approaches, but also um, he's breaking them down into different modalities of a hybrid system, like a you know a system that enters into contact and breaks contact, and and how to learn the the transitions between contact and how to learn the amount of model and the amount of data uh, driven. Um, uh, kind of um, boxes, um, outputs he's going to be using for uh, for the outcome. And um, at the same time, during those times, he worked very hard on, on a software that he he dubbed, he created it from scratch. It's a software architecture called PNC, uh, Planning and Control. And it's sort of a, a general, like a middleware for humanoid robots. You, you have the state machines, you have feedback controls, you have um, um, quadratic programs, um, you have uh, different sort of um, uh, dynamic algorithms, um, and um, and then you have the simulations and so on and so forth, right? And we this has been widely used in the lab. And finally, a um, couple more. Recently, he published an algorithm called Tower Plus, which uses basically optimal control, but um, for for locomotion, in, incorporating uh, the, the perceptual part of it, like um, the elevation maps of of the environment. So a robot a biped uh, can take a decision to walk from point A to point B, and it can come up with all the, um, all the, um, if you will, all the torque sequence, if you will, all the all the reaction force sequence in order to get there, right? So it's a kind of a long horizon planning, uh, but also he incorporates manipulation as well. And finally, uh, he just finished preparing a paper on explainability. This means that humanoids are, you know, um, uh, grabbing, you know, they are they are receiving commands and um, verbal commands, sort of, and they are trying to figure out if they are feasible or not, right? So there's there's a reachability um, um, analysis, and there is a machine learning approach to do it really really fast. So he, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm sure he will explain all these details. So that's it, Jung Hyuk, please go ahead, and um, uh, if you have any question, interrupt him, or we can ask the questions at the end. Either way. Okay, thanks for the, oh, Dr. Chen is here, I guess. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. 
everybody can see my screen. Yep. Okay. Um, Hey, um, hello everyone, my name is Jun Yuk, and I really appreciate you all for being here as committee members and guest members. And I'll start my defense presentation titled by um, Toward Versatile High Performing and Interactive Humanoids. Um, humanoids are advantages over wheeled robots or quadrupeds in terms of versatility, adaptability, and mobility. However, deploying a practical humanoid in real life remains a challenge. And one difficulty comes from the multidisciplinary nature of the field. And for instance, elaborate actuation technologies and robot whole body planning and control frameworks are all necessary for um, high performing humanoid. Um, and this is a biped uh, robot, Drake Convergent 2, which has only 10 degrees of freedom, but see how many com complicated mechatronics parts and planning and control algorithms are composing it. So my research statement for my PhD is for versatile, high-performing and interactive humanoids, wide range of technologies, including robust actuator control, efficient planning and control algorithms, and intelligent high-level decision-making should be studied at the same time. Uh, with that in mind, my PhD studies are composed of three parts. In the first part, um, I studied an actuator called viscoelastic liquid cold actuator and designed impedance controllers for the actuator and evaluated them with robotics platforms. In the second part, I studied various planning and control frameworks for various problems. In the last part, I investigated data-driven approaches for dynamics model learning and safety verification for general legacy systems. Um, here are the robotic platforms. I've performed experiments during my PhD. So this is a VLCA, viscoelastic liquid collectuator, where I designed an impedance control. And these two robots are a two-dov single leg test bed ray conversion one. And this robot is 10-dov line fit robot ray conversion two. And they are all built based on this VLCA technology. And while developing control and planning frameworks, I worked with ray conversion two and Draco version three, which is humanoid and other humanoid robots in simulations. First, I will start with part one. Part one includes some collaboration with the Austin-based robotics company, Eptronic, and my previous colleague, Dongyun. And to be more specific, chapter two introduces a new actuation technology, VLCA, and describes how we chose mechanical component of the actuator, how we design an impedance controller, and how we control Draco version one. Um, chapter three introduces a new line fit biped robot, Draco two, um, and describes how we control it based upon the actuation studies in chapter two. Um, here are some existing actuation technologies where each of them has its own pros and cons. For instance, this UT series elastic actuator um, developed in our lab back in 2014 demonstrated great energy efficiency, um, impact resistance, and force controllability, but shows poor torque density and poor um, position controllability. And the research motivation of part one is to study all around actuator in terms of these five metrics and devise a robotic platform based on the new actuation. Um, therefore, we aim to study a new type of series elastic actuator dubbed viscoelastic liquid cold actuator by replacing the metal spring in UT series elastic actuator with the elastomer and incorporating a liquid cooling system. So we replaced the metal spring in SIA with the polyurethane elastomer here. And the mechanical power is transmitted when the BLDC motor turns the ball knob via this low loss timing belt and pulley which causes the ball screw to exert a force to the actuator outputs. The viscoelastic element enables the actuator to be more shock tolerant than the rigid actuators. It also enables high output impedance due to inherent damping in the elastomer that increases controller's stability. We also install the um, liquid cooling jacket around the BLDC motor for active heat dissipation. Um, this actuator is equipped with uh, the temperature sensor to estimate the motor core temperature and a load cell 
and a quadrature encoder to measure force with high quality. So we identify the actuator dynamics through system identification um, in the frequency domain and built four different force feedback controllers. The first one shown in A is the most basic PD controller that uses um, force adder and its derivatives. The second one um, represented in the blue box composes feedback signal using force adder and motor velocity instead of a force adder derivative. And you further consider two variations of the second one. One is to add an integral controller and the other one is to add a disturbance observer. Um, we studied a phase margin of the controllers and showed that the second force controller is more robust to the uh, time delay than the first controller. This is because the motor velocity signal from the motor quadrature encoder has much cleaner quality than force adder derivative signals. Also, PD plus disturbance observer showed better performance than PID controller in terms of their phase margin and maximum phase lag. Um, this is Draco version one. Um, there are two viscoelastic liquid fold actuator on the knee and on the ankle. And in this video, I was testing an impedance controller and it is designed to be compliant in horizontal direction, but stiff in the uh, vertical direction. Um, this is Draco version two um, and it has five VLCAs per each leg. And this is the Draco version two walking using the algorithm developed by my previous colleague. Um, in part two, I introduced humanoid motion planning and control frameworks for various problems. Uh, for in instance, in chapter four, I trained a two-step policy using- So, uh, jung it, it yeah. would be convenient, I, I know you didn't write it, but you say where, where did you publish this, this work? Like, like for every chapter that you present, mm -hmm. perhaps you can say where you publish. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that, but chapter two, I published a- um, Journal paper to transaction uh, mechatronics with Donghyun and Electronic. Um, in the work in chapter three, I published a conference paper to 2019 to Humanoid Conference um, with the work with Reiko by Robot. Yeah. Um, in Thanks. chapter yeah. in chapter four, I trained a first step policy using safe reinforcement learning. And in chapter five, I combined the phase space planner and RRT to generate local motion plan in complex maze environment. Lastly, in chapter six, I devised a new type of simplified model called composite rigid body model and formulate a trajectory optimization problem. So let's start with chapter four. In chapter four, I'm trying to solve a problem called one step local motion planning problem. Uh, where once the locomotion planning is to compute a next good step landing location at every stepping in real time to make robot balancing. Um, since it is looking ahead, one step ahead, it is reference trajectory agnostic planner and the robot keeps its balance as if it repetitively falls and recovers. Um, we call this uh, walking style as a reactive style walking or informally drunken walking. And there are many successful locomotion examples. These um, two are Mercury and Draco 2 from our lab. And this one is Cassie Robot from Agility Robotics that uses this one-step locomotion plan. So how this one-step locomotion plan works? They normally uses a simplified model and it's analytic solution with a lot of heuristic and computes the first step. For instance, our time to velocity reversal first step planner we use for Mercury and Draco version two um, abstracts the model, uh, the robot's dynamic using linear inverted pendulum model and computes a first step landing location that can stabilize center of mass velocity. However, although we are able to make some successful results, as you can see in the video clip, there were many failure cases. Um, this happened fr pretty frequently when the robot fails to step the desired landing location computed by the TVR planner. 
Uh, this might be caused by the model discrepancy or tracking error by whole body controller. But anyway, I had to do an Arduos engineering for the TVR planner after every single experiment, such as gain tuning and add an arbitrary number to the first step commands. So it was repetition of performing an experiment with a set of parameter, observing how it goes and changing parameters and so on. At the end, I realized that I was a human agent doing a reinforcement learning to generate better first step and make it walk. So finally, I came up with an idea. Um, can I let the machine automatically do this arduous process using machine learning? So here is the proposed approach. Just to recap, this is how I controlled Draco 2 with TVR planner and whole body controller, where the TVR planner computes a first step and whole body controller stabilized the robot. And preserving this structure, I proposed a new step, a new first step planner by placing a neural net, neural network policy in parallel to improve TVR in a data-driven manner with a safety projection module. In the training, I closed the loop with a whole body controller and read the reverse signals by observing how well the robot walks with the first step output. Um, the proposed framework is different from the end-to-end -end learning method that trains a single large neural network policy that directly maps joint states to joint torque. Compared to this work, my framework leverages more domain expertise and prior knowledge, which enables data efficient and safe learning of locomotion. Um, this, is, this is a figure shows the first set policy structures in more details. The model-based TVR planner uses linear inverted pendulum model and its analytic solution to compute initial um, guess or guidance. Then the stochastic neural network policy add an offset on top of the TVR output. Uh, this can be a feed forward exploration in the training phase or can be a correction on the TVR for better walk in execution phase. Um, lastly, the safety projection mechanism solves QP problem with control barrier function and projects the sum into the safe action set. And the control barrier function here um, can be specified based on one-step capture region or two-step capture region of an inverted pendulum model. To be more specific, TVR measures a current CON position and current velocity, uh, CON velocity and current footstep uh, location and finds a new footstep location so that the CON comes to a stop after T seconds. Uh, next, the stochastic neural network is simply composed of two fully connected layers, and it takes floating base state pivot foot configuration and computes a mean and standard deviation of a Gaussian distribution to sample a new, uh, to sample a next first step location, which is added to the TVR planner. Um, then the safety projection module take the summation of TVR and neural network and project these to unsafe action set. It assumes that the safe set of state C is given and approximates dynamic using Gaussian process regression and finally solves an optimization problem to get a safe action so that the system can still remain in the safe set C after applying the action using control barrier function. For the safe set computation, I borrowed the concept of capturability developed by Tuan uh, where it represents uh, state space regions where the pendulum can come to a stop within one step or two steps. Um, I executed a series of experiments with Draco version 2 and Atlas to evaluate the proposed uh, first step policy. I apologize that this figure is too small, but the orange curve um, is what I proposed for locomotion learning. And the dotted line is the TVR baseline, and the purple and the green are the end-to-end -end learning baseline. So the first plot shows an average return during the training process, and it shows that the orange curve um, learns walking data efficiently compared to the end-to-end -end learning approaches. And it also show it outperforms TVR baseline. Um, the second plot shows the number of termination per episode and demonstrates the effectiveness of safety projection mechanism. And last plot shows 
uh, that my learning framework results in better quality of walking compared to other baselines. And on the right, I demonstrated that the proposed framework can be generalized to various types of locomotion, such as turning and walking over irregular terrain, which cannot be represented in a linear inverted pendulum uh, based planner. Um, this work is published uh, to Robotics Letter uh, in 2020. Um, okay, now let's move on to chapter five. In chapter five, I solve a multi-step locomotion planning problem. A multi-step planning problem requires to generate a long horizon and collision-free locomotion plan, normally more than 10 steps in a maze-like environment. An existing approach is, um, to this problem is to solve a sequence of footsteps first using a simple geometric model that can approximate robot kinematics and using a sampling-based search algorithm. Then they consider about uh, dynamic motion over the predefined footstep sequence. This approach is um, limited in that kinematic feasibility does not always guarantee dynamic feasibility, meaning the predefined footstep sequence may not be a good sequence from the dynamics perspective. Also, it is limited because there is no notion on when to traverse um, footsteps before they compute dynamic motion, which doesn't allow to check collision with dynamic obstacles. And the studies in chapter five is motivated to ask this question. Can I consider a robot's walking dynamics together with a footstep search? To answer this question, I abstract a, planner, a planning problem with a non-holonomic car in the reduced configuration space. For instance, a node in the configuration space is represented with its XY location and its heading and its forward velocity. Note that each node contains information of robot's COM position and also the pivot location as well. Um, and in, in, some, in sampling based um, search, once a new node is added in the configuration space, I use a Dubin's car model to steer and connect the node. And these Dubin's car model approximate kinematics of the robot, including turning radius, forward velocity, and step length. Finally, through the edit nodes, I propagate LIPM dynamics using a phase space planner, which finds a pivot in lateral direction and COM position that can generate required forward velocity at the second node. Um, this is an overview of the algorithm. In the map, there are given start and goal configuration with the obstacle. Once a new node is sampled, um, Dubin's car generates all possible paths from the node in the tree to the newly sampled node. Then LIPM dynamics is propagated along the path. And among these collision free, uh, free paths, I pick the fastest path and connect. Um, as shown in D, the nodes in the tree include information on dynamic locomotion as well. This is a demonstration of Valkyrie humanoid navigating the maze environment, including three moving obstacles. Um, as you can see in the left figure, the solution tree has, expand, has been expanded beyond the moving obstacles path because the, the algorithm knows the timings, timing information for the nodes. Okay, um, yeah, the previous work has been published to uh, 2018 IROS. Um, now let's move on to chapter six. Chapter six aims to solve a multi-step locomotion planning problem whose goal is to optimize many decision variables automatically with a comprehensive model for several number of steps. What I mean by optimizing many variables um, is that now all these variables are decided by the optimization. For comparison, a uh, previous one-step planning problem only decides contact position and the others were pre-specified by human. Also, what I mean by using a comprehensive model is that the dynamics model should be descriptive enough to optimize these variables, but still need to be simple for multi-step planning. For instance, LIPM model is not sufficient to represent robots angular momentum or multi-context scenario. 
but the and the full dynamics model is comprehensive model, but too complex for the multi-step planning problem. Um, and there's a state-of-the-art framework for this problem called Tower, developed by Winkler. And it uses a single rigid body dynamics model to, to represent the system and solve for many decision variables. Um, single rigid body dynamics represents more accurate dynamics than LIPM, since it has a notion of inertia. This framework uses a phase-based parameterization to formulate contact constraints instead of using linear complementary problem, which makes the algorithm computationally efficient. To be more specific, uh, the single rigid body model assumes there is a single rigid body with a constant inertia in COM frame and with the massless legs. And the equation of mo motion looks like this, where the inertia I is a constant value. This constant inertia in the single rigid body model is, is a reasonable assumption for quadrupeds, which normally has a negligible mass on the legs. However, um, for the case of humanoid, humanoid is another species that has heavier distal mass and can use whole body coordination for inertia shaping to achieve this kind of complex behavior. Since the humanoid's composite rigid body inertia is a function of joint configuration, Previous work had to solve inverse kinematic during the optimization process to know joint positions, even though they only uses reduced order model for dynamics constraints. Therefore, um, the research question I had in chapter six um, is, can I consider a humanoid's composite rigid body inertia in trajectory optimization without solving inverse kinematics? Um, after playing with some random configuration of a humanoid, I found the fact that a uh, humanoid's composite rigid body inertia can be precisely predicted from its floating base and end effectors configuration if the joint space redundancy can be reasonably eliminated. And what I mean by joint space redundancy is that in general, humanoid um, can have multiple joint configurations for one floating base and end effectors configuration. But if we can remove this redundancy in a smart way, whether that be using joint limits or imposing an optimization cost to pick one, now there can be a one-to-one -one relationship between end effector config and joint config, and further between end effector config uh, to composite inertia. Therefore, the approach proposed in chapter six is pretty simple. I train a composite inertia neural network in offline that predicts the inertia from end effector configs and use the network in the trajectory optimization. One reason I chose a neural network instead of, instead of pre-calculated lookup table for inertia prediction is that I could provide an analytic Jacobian for, for the optimization solver, which can improve computation speed significantly. To generate a training data set, I produced a stepping light motions instead of sampling random joint configurations. I parameterized stepping motion with an initial and final configuration of the torso and end effectors including foot swinging and sample a motion. Uh, figure B is an example of one sampled motion. And then I collect a couple of frames in the, in the motion and solve inverse kinematics considering joint limits and nominal positions of the robot to compute joint configuration for each frame. Um, for each frame of motion, um, I using the joint configuration, I, I compute the composite inertias. And then they becomes a training data where the input is base and end effector config, and the output is the composite inertia. Um, this shows the formulation of the optimization problem. And this optimizes a floating base trajectories um, and end effector trajectories and reaction force profile at contact while satisfying dynamic constraints and contact constraints. And in the dynamic equation here, now this inertia term is not a constant anymore, but a neural network uh, function I trained earlier, which allows to consider composite inertias based on the base and end effector configurations. 
Um, this video shows some trajectories planned by the optimization. And the robot, in, the, in this video, the robot runs and climbs a stair. And you can also see the robot uses its arm for inertia shaping when it jumps. Um, so with this study, I submitted a paper to Frontiers in Robotics AI in 2021. Finally, in the last part, I describe data-driven approaches for dynamics model. So one quick question, John Hyuk. In the previous yeah. video, you are touching the wall. Yes. So, uh, so that that's a, it, this is a, this is the result of the search, right? That the optimizer yeah. fi finds that it has to touch the wall. Yeah, right? the optimizer finds the position of the contact and timings of the contact and the reaction forces it's going to generate from the wall. Okay. Um, finally, in the last part, I, um, I study a dynamics model learning and safety verification for general leg systems. Um, especially in chapter seven, I talk about dynamics model learning, which means a supervised learning of state evolution given a current state and a input. And there is a black box modeling approach using deep neural network and white box modeling approach that exploits domain knowledge and leaves few parameters for identification. For instance, this pendulum has a state alpha and alpha dot and an input torque tau. Um, to represent the dynamics of the system, white box modeling approach assumes a robot's kinematic and dynamic properties and derive equation of motion using first principle. And using this equation, they only learn a few parameters such as mass and the length of pendulum. The assumption in the white box approach may not capture hard to model effects such as friction and may result in model bias. On the other hand, a black box modeling approach does not care too much about underlying physics law and develop, deploys a deep neural network. The black box approach requires tremendously large amount of training data to achieve generalization and often suffers from model variance. Um, this is so-called bias and variance trade-off in dynamics learning, where the white box modeling suffers from high bias and the black box modeling suffers from high variance. Therefore, the research question in chapter seven is the following. Um, we already have decent amount of knowledge on the robotic system, such as the weight of the robot, the length of the link and the governing physics law. And can we use this prior knowledge to solve this bias and variance trade-off and represent dynamical system in a better way? Uh, to investigate this question, I leverage a mixture of expert for dynamic system learning. Before I go into the deep, uh, let me briefly introduce the concept of mixture of experts. A mixture of expert is a network composed of many separate feed for subnetworks and ensembles the outputs of the subnetworks to improve model performance in the supervised learning procedure. It includes a gating network uh, that decides what combination of the experts should be used for each data input. The figure shows an example of MOE with N local experts. Um, and a gating network G that computes the output with this expression. Um, each expert is trained to either cooperate or compete to produce the output based on a loss function. For instance, a loss function with the above expression makes the um, local experts contributes to the output linearly. With this loss function, each expert is trained to produce an output that eliminates the residual errors left by the other experts. Um, and when the local experts cooperate to generate the output, we call this MOE um, as a cooperative MOE. Conversely, another loss function below makes each local expert produce the whole output rather than the residual and respond only to a subset of 
of the data set. As a result, each expert is not directly affected by the weights of other experts, which can be useful when we know in advance that a set of training data set is naturally classified into particular expert categories. Uh, when the local experts compete to generate the output, we call this uh, competitive MOE. Um, based on this, I devised a, a nested mixture of experts for representing and learning complex robotic systems, including hybrid systems. As depicted in the figure, um, an MOE has a nested structure of an MOE. Um, the top layer forms a competitive MOE with M local experts and a gating network. As a nested structure, each of the blue boxes forms another cooperative MOE containing two local ellipsoids and a gating network. The gating network in G, uh, the gating network G in the bottom layer combines the output from the ellipsoids and produce O. And the gating network in the top layer H combines the O's to produce Y. Um, so we define a loss function as following so that the blue boxes in the top layer are trained to compute, compete each other, whereas the two ellipsoids in the bottom layers are trained to cooperate. Due to this loss function, um, each, each of the blue boxes produces um, the whole output and correlates with a subset of the data set that is determined by its gating network H. In contrast, the two ellipsoids inside the bottom layer contribute to the output linearly, which is determined by their gating network G. So using this network structure, I tried to incorporate two types of prior knowledge. The first one is an information on physical context between a system and an environment. And I incorporated this into the top layer. I also considered the robot's kinematic structure and dynamic properties, which is embraced in the bottom layer. And I'll explain how I construct a network structure with examples. Um, the first example is a two degree, degrees of freedom manipulator. And this shows the free body diagram of the system. Since there is no contact between the robot and the environment, I construct an NMOE with one expert at the top layer. Uh, bottom layer always has two local experts. One is a black box model and the other one is a white box model. The white box model is an analytic manipulator equation based on the free body diagram. And the black box model is a neural network that tries to learn residual of the white box model. So basically the black box model is supposed to compensate the effects of joint friction or damping, for instance. Uh, the mixing ratio of this white box model and this black box model is determined by the gating network G. In the second example, this is called a cart with elastic wall, where the cart has a, a cart has a single degree of freedom sliding along the incline pin. And the cart has to interact with the elastic wall below here and accumulate energy to reach to a desired height, accounting for actuator limits. These two um, are the free body diagrams according to two different interaction modes. One is in contact with the elastic wall and the other one is contact free mode. Um, and in the NMOE structure, there are two local experts at the top layer corresponding to each contact mode. And the gating network H is trained to select the mode for each input. Similarly, each bottom layer is composed of white box model and black box model. This illustrates a gating network output after convergence. Note that the vector H was used to select the mode in cart with elastic wall example, where H1 was a weight for contact mode and H2 was a weight for the contact free mode. And the phase plot demonstrates that the NMOE assigns state space region of negative velocity and negative displacement 
where the card is most likely contacting with the elastic wall to the contact mode by using high value on H1. Um, similarly, the NMOE assigns the top right regions in the state space uh, to contact-free mode by using high value on H2. Um, in the richer example, this G1 was a weight on the black box model or black box ellipsoid. And the second value for G vector was a weight on the white box ellipsoid. And I trained on an MOE in using different views and B where they are joint friction and damping. And as, as you can see, as the mu and B increases, meaning as the white box model becomes less accurate, the gating network more relies on the black box modeling for dynamic representation. I also evaluate the NMOE framework using various continuous control domains. For all experimental domain, I uniformly sample training and test data sets. Then I train the NMOE and the baseline models and measure a root mean square error using a test set. We train the models with various size of training sets ranging from two to the power of eight to two to the power of 12 sizes and evaluate them with a test set with two to the power of 12. Um, this experiment shows, the, shows that the proposed method represented with a uh, gray color um, successfully outperform related baseline method in terms of data efficiency and generalization to unseen data and bias variance trade-off. And this work um, has been published to 2020 L4DC. Um, okay, uh, now let's move on to the final chapter um, where I study a formal verification problem where it predicts a safety probability of the closed loop behavior given a trajectory planner and feedback controller and a system. And why is why safety verification is important? First, if we have a safety verification tool, uh, then it can enable feedback motion planning which considers uncertainty of the system and robustly generate trajectory. Secondly, let's say there is a closed loop system that is supposed to be stabilized along the reference trajectory. And if we have a safety verification tool, then whenever future unsafety is predicted, then we can just retrieve, uh, we can trigger the replanning for, uh, for robustness. Lastly, consider a human robot interaction scenario where a non-expert end user gives an instruction to a robot. And safety verification tool can be implemented in the robot so that the robot can um, give a feedback to the human based on the safety judgment. Um, there are many existing works that aim to solve this formal verification problem. There are hamilton jacobi reachability analysis and contraction theory, um, and they try to um, do offline characterization of tracking error bounds around the trajectories. And two-phase MPC verifies safety um, satisfactions for all realization of uncertainty. Um, however, the existing strategies all require analytic expression of the closed loop system and are computationally inefficient and are limited to a small class of systems. Therefore, um, these existing approaches makes them difficult to implement it for legacy systems. So this chapter um, aims to study a data-driven safety verification method that can use sophisticated physics simulator instead of an analytic expression of the system and allows a quick evaluation in real time. Here's the approach overview. Um, the approach trains a safety assessment function that computes a safety probability of a closed loop system. Um, SA, SAF takes state measurement and upcoming reference trajectory as an input. Um, and during the, during the training, an initial state and a reference trajectory are labeled with an unsafety score, which is evaluated through the physics simulator. Um, in the training, the data trajectory data is embedded into a low-dimensional space, 
and the embedded trajectory gets assigned a safety belief. For instance, the belief assignment on the ith trajectory data um, is noted by bi, uh, where the first represents the probability of being safe, and the second represents the probability of being unsafe, and the last one represents the subjective uncertainty. I Two comments on uh, yeah. how you define safety from the physics simulator. Yeah, what so space quantity corresponds with safety. Yeah, the physics simulation simulator is given a kind of safety criteria as a function. So for instance, for a humanoid balance, balancing problem, one can um, set the function um, that can tell if the center of mass is inside the supporting polygon, then the physics simulation use that function and that criteria to tell if, if the episode was safe or unsafe. So if there was a case where the robot center of mass got beyond the supporting polygon, then the physics simulation said this episode was unsafe, for instance. So the safety criteria is given by given by human. So you would say it would be specific to whatever um, robotic system you are controlling. Exactly. Another right. example would be um, hitting the joint limits. So maybe we already know like joint limits for, for each joints and once the joint measurement reaches to the joint limit, then the physics simulator says, oh, now it reaches unsafe re uh, state space region and terminate that episode. Yep, then um, we discretize the law dimensional space here and I count the embedded trajectories in, the, in each grid cell and finally assign a safety belief to the grids. Uh, to be more specific, the training is composed of three main parts. The first part is data generation part. And the second part is low dimensional embedding of the data set. And the third part is computing a belief assignment over the discretized grid in the low dimensional space. In the data generation, I sample a reference trajectory and simulate it using a physics simulator. Here, um, the red trajectory is the reference trajectory and the blue trajectory is the actual trajectory in the simulator. And based on the simulation result, I segment trajectory and assign an unsafety score to the segment by following this rule. Uh, basic intuition on the safety score is that if there happens any constraint violation during the simulation, the unsafety score for the segments has some positive value considering a discounting factor. And if there happens no constraint violation during the simulation, then the unsafety score is zero for all segments. And these, um, the condition for the trajectory is to be safe or unsafe is given by human. Um, the trajectory data labeled with the unsafety score can be visualized in the trajectory space where the red dots are unsafe trajectories and the blue dots are safe trajectories. And based on the unsafety score, I compute a distance for each data so that small distance is measured between the same colors but large distance between the different colors. And using this distance metric, I applied TSNE technique and obtained two clusters separated in a law dimensional space Y. And here one is the cluster of safe trajectory and the other cluster is unsafe trajectories. Then I assigned a safety belief for the embedded trajectories where um, the subjective uncertainty is set based on the confidence on the physics simulator. In other words, if I believe simulation more and more, then I can, I can set this uncertainty to be low, lower value. Uh, and the probability of unsafe is set to be proportional to the unsafety score. And in, in this manner, every data, data um, will be assigned a belief, belief map. Um, 
Lastly, I, in the discretized low dimensional space, I count the trajectories uh, in each cell and fuse their safety assignment using this fusion operator to represent the safety belief on the cell. For instance, this cell where the safe trajectories mostly reside are fused to be safe. In the evaluation phase, once the robot receive a reference trajectory, it is directly mapped to the low dimensional space and it reads the grid cell's safety assignment to, the, uh, to predict the safety. Um, this is an example of Laikago balancing scenario. And here the closed loop system is composed of the planner that generates a trajectory and the inverse kinematic space fit the controller. Um, this bottom left plot shows the desired trajectory, uh, which is red, and the actual trajectory, which is blue. And the second plot shows a real-time safety predict prediction over time. Um, during the balancing, the robot is disturbed twice at time index B and time index D. And whenever the SAF module predicts unsafety, the recovery step is supposed to be triggered. So for instance, at this time index B, the first, the first collision happens with a, light, light, with a lightweight and slow speed ball, which pushes away the robot from the desired trajectory, but still the future prediction, um, the future behavior is predicted to be safe. Um, at the time index D, the second collision happens with a heavier and a faster speed ball, which pushes away the robot again from the desired trajectory. Um, and the safety assessment function predicts this will be unsafe, uh, which means um, in current reference trajectory and controller is not good for good enough for stabilizing the robot. Accordingly, um, recovery step planner is triggered uh, so that the robot can make recovery step instead. Um, the last plot shows the first prediction had been made at, um, at this grid cell, and it moves to B, C, and finally it reaches to unsafe grid. Here is another demonstration where the Draco 3 provides a safety feedback to human given a verbal instruction. Grab the blue object. Okay. I cannot safely grasp it because I would fall forward. Walk two steps forward. Okay. So in the video, the human gives an alternative um, instruction to make Grab the, first the blue substitute. object. Okay. Okay, so um, here are some journals I published during my PhD. Um, and here are some conference papers I published during my PhD. Um, this is all my presentation and I appreciate for being here and I'll take uh, questions. All right, okay, thank you, Jung Hyok. And uh, we're gonna go first and uh, take questions from the general audience. Um, uh, at, I mean, if the committee wants to ask questions, they can do it uh, uh, informally. And, and after the questions from the general audience, we're gonna switch to, uh, we're gonna ask everybody to be out except the committee and the candidate. Um, and then we'll ask uh, more private questions. So uh, please, uh, anybody has any question, uh, go ahead and ask it now. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Max. Generic, uh, first off, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, can you talk a little bit more about eliminating the joint space redundancy in the uh, the trained inertia model? Yeah. Let me go back to the slides. Yeah. So, um, so I would um, start from joint space redundancy. So, for instance, if you solve inverse kinematic problem or 
for a given a end vector position or foot position, for instance, um, there can be two different um, joint configuration given one um, foot position, maybe like bent the knee forward, or there, there might be some case where the robot bent the knee in opposite direction, right? Um, but in, in actual scenario, the second one is not reasonable, right? Because of the joint limit. So um, by imposing this kind of joint limit and then uh, using this kind of joint limit property, we can kind of enforce one-to-one -one mapping uh, from end vector config to joint space config. And another um, way of enforcing this is enforcing the robot close close as possible to the nominal pose, for instance. So let's say um, for, for the hand position, there can be multiple ways to represent these um, hand position in joint space, right? And, but in the controller side, you can say, you can specify nominal position so that the robot just pick one of the solutions um, and try to be close as close as possible to the nominal pose. And this is another way you can eliminate joint space redundancy. So in your implementation, does the, the dimension of the inputs match the joint space dimension? Or if there are like floating variables still, how, how much redundancy did you find to be like an acceptable amount? Or um, so I further uh, limit the inverse kinematic um, to this kind of walking motion, especially in this walking motion, I don't see any redundancy. So I was um, almost able to find one-to-one -one mapping from end defector space to joint space. And therefore I can, uh, I could find a um, unique inertia for each uh, configuration. Great, thank you so much. Any other question from the general audience? Okay, well, thank you everyone from the general audience. And now I'm gonna ask you to leave and uh, from John Kyok, um, stop the recording. And we're gonna go into questions from the committee. So let's wait um, a few seconds for everyone to log out, except for the committee and the candidates. 